Sadowski? Here. Trusty Benucci? Here. Trusty Lamb? Here. Trusty O'Rourke? Here. Trusty Peck? Here. Trusty Rasich? Mayor Collins? Here. The rise of the flag. We're seeking a motion to approve the minutes of the Committee of the Whole Workshop held on October 26th. So moved. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Thank you. That motion carries. Presidential comments? I only have one. Uh, I want to thank uh, members of the board and also in the audience here and the viewing audience uh, to have a uh, safe Veterans Day on Wednesday. And to all those individuals, both ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your service. And that's all I have. Trustees comments? Trustees comments? For no trustees' comments, this would be the time for public comments. If there are no public comments, and we'll proceed with the workshop meeting. First item on the agenda is the 2015 tax levy. Thank you very much. Uh, tonight, we, besides having the tax levy as well, we'll continue having our conversations uh, regarding the various uh, general fund uh, uh, departmental budgets, including the police department, administration, planning, and building department and some other general fund uh, revenues. Uh, Mrs. Pleckham will take us through a discussion on the tax levy. Uh, as she's showing that to you, I do want to point out that we took a very conservative position in laying out the general fund revenues in the tax levy, um, not knowing exactly where the state is going to be when they finally do approve a budget. We again took a v an extremely conservative position on uh, what the, that their impact could very well be on our budget. Uh, even with, uh, as um, uh, conservative, I hate using the word conservative regularly, but it just seems to work. Um, even with that rather uh, austere, how's that for a better choice of words? Austere position, um, we still show ourselves as uh, coming to you with a, um, a balanced uh, proposed budget. That proposed budget, however, doesn't reflect the three positions that we have been talking about. Those three positions will be something that we talk about tonight. And once we have a better understanding of where the state is going to be on their budget, that's when we can have a, a much longer conversation with regard to those three positions that we had previously uh, discussed. Uh, the mayor and I will be going to have some meetings with the Will County Governmental League and probably have some additional understanding and briefings on where uh, the state tends to or expects to uh, fall with regard to those issues. Um, and we'll continue to monitor those items. But even with our most conservative and austere positions, we, we are presenting what would be a balanced budget against uh, where, we, uh, where we would be at this point. Uh, so with that, uh, Mrs. Blackham, I know I stole most of your story, but I will uh, turn it over to you to present the tax levy. We'll start with the tax levy. Um, as the board's aware, each year the village must approve um, the annual property tax levy ordinance and file it by the last Tuesday in December. This is the first step in the process is uh, talking through uh, what needs to happen. Uh, today we'll look at... Um, figures for the preliminary estimate, and that will move to publication. Public hearing will come in early December with possible approval at that time. Uh, what you have on the screen and what's in your packet is the equalized assessed value for the village and the tax levy rate projections and the revenue projections are really a product of the village's overall equalized assessed value. And if you see in the last few years, we've had a reduction um, up until 2014 where last year we saw just over a 2% increase in the village's equalized assessed value. Based on what we're seeing preliminary um, from Will and Kendall counties, uh, staff is expecting EAV to increase by approximately 4%, um, but we won't have those official numbers until the spring of 2016. 
Uh, the second slide that I have on the screen is just, uh, it's in your packet as well, is the property tax rates since 2003 and the extension amounts uh, through 2014. As you can see, the last uh, five years, uh, we've maintained an equal uh, dollar value. Um, the way that they calculate the rates at the, at the county level is they base it on dollars and not the rates. So within your packet, when you look through the calculations, you'll see within the memo portion what uh, staff believes the estimated levy will be with the 4% EAV increase. I have a slide on that as well. There it is. And the difference within what was extended in 2014. Staff is anticipating an increase of about just over 200000 in in total levy dollars based on a 4% increase in equalized assessed value. Um, but because there's needs within different uh, funds within the village, specifically toward immunity as well as police pension, the general fund, corporate general fund, will see a slight reduction, basically staying flat. Uh, we're showing a reflection of just over $32,000 within the revenues in the corporate fund. So although there'll be a slight increase with what staff is estimating of about $200,000, corporate fund will see a slight reduction um, based on what, we, what we're seeing today. Staff is recommending, though, as far as the extension of the levy, uh, we always seem to, because, because the way the rate is calculated, we're estimating a slightly higher EAV. Um, we're actually recommending that we consider a preliminary estimate of 5917100 And what that will do is it will capture, um, to ensure that the village captures the entire amount of the village's EAV and still maintain the same rate as last year of 0.4669. So that's why there's a two different numbers for those that have uh, not been through the tax levy process here. Uh, typical property tax levy for a $250,000 house in 2014. Uh, I've had on the screen here. The Village of Plainfields portion is only 4.87% of the overall tax bill last year, meaning that um, for every dollar that's paid in property taxes, 4.87 cents is paid directly back to the Village of Plainfield for operations and levy purposes. Um, with that, uh, after we have our discussion tonight, November, th um, December 3rd's uh, Village Board meeting, or the next Village Board meeting, will acknowledge a preliminary estimate for 5917100 um, then it will be publicized within the local papers. December 7th, the public hearing will occur, and then possible consideration will also happen that night. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have on levy. You also have a couple extra um, charts within your packet that shows basically the same thing that's on the screen now, just in different formats. So I'm not sure if there's any questions, but I'd be happy to answer them now. I always have some questions, so I apologize. Oh, trying to figure all this out so I read this memo probably at least three or four times and I still didn't understand it so I will ask so I get the levies going up the four percent and then we have a, a total request for which represented but that doesn't match I don't think what's in the budget correct correct it's roughly about an eight percent increase in the request itself however because the policy has been for the village to maintain the same rate um, we're anticipating an actual increase of just about 4%. Um, what happens is if you don't, if the estimate's based on the dollar value itself, so if the levy isn't um, extended with the dollar value, um, if the rate calculations come out differently, uh, if the levy comes out higher, we may not be able to capture the 100% of the rate that the board has typically extended the last few years, the 0.4669. So, so what? Ha oh, I'm sorry. So what happens? I should probably say this. Um, once the actual numbers come in in March, staff will get the calculations, preliminary calculations, and based. And what will happen is there will be a rate extended on those preliminary numbers. Staff then reviews the rates and makes the corrections to ensure that the rate is still 0.4669, regardless of what the EAV comes in at. Then the next part that you're most likely taking a look at is from the EAV memo as compared to then the budget uh, projections you saw that the budget projection is still less than that we don't capture 100 percent in a, in a given year there's always a percentage of uh, 
uh, tax uh, payments that uh, don't get paid within that particular year and they go off for tax sale so we don't capture a hundred percent of our revenue in any given in that given well, year I was looking at it probably so yes, I, you are. I hear the four but then I see like it's like two and a half or something actually. correct so there that's back to that conservatism again yes sir okay thank right you. thank you I just had one other comment I guess for just for the and really it was good learnings for me in the public and I think you had this slide up there before but we talk about the our the village percentage of the total tax bill is 4.8 and i think if you look at the will county forest preserve at 8.7 they're pro approximately two times as much of a levy than the villages and then if you look at the plainfield fire department district at 10.5 they're over two times as much as well so i think i don't know if a lot of residents understand that part but i just wanted to make a point to to kind of show that i think as you had in your earlier slide so thank you Comparison to uh, Will County and the Forest Preserve, I believe their budget is in excess of $300 million. And can you, um, uh, Brian, quickly um, answer what our budget normally is for our corporate and capital that we? I'd gladly take the interest off of there. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, our overall uh, corporate budget is about $20 million. Okay. So we're looking at $20 million versus approximately $300 million, and we're able to be here at 4.87 percent I guess my question then for um, possibly Tracy and maybe Brian as well uh, what um, I guess essentially what can the board do to properly communicate with staff to make sure that we're all on the same page as far as levying the same amount of money not necessarily the same percentage if we end up being able to lower it maybe that might be great but I want to make sure that the new trustees understand that in the past we have kept the levy amount the same regardless of maybe the percentage going up a point or two um, a tenth of a point or two and we responded to that and said no we didn't actually raise the amount that we're taking in we're operating on the same dollar amount actually up until two years ago what we did is we took a position that we would only take a certain dollar amount so since 2009 uh, we have uh, either seen a reduction in the total dollar amount that's come into the village on property taxes or seen it stay the same um, two years ago we made a commitment that we would uh, because we were hearing from our residents that listen that's a little disingenuous we would much rather see you just set the rate and and live by whatever that rate is so that's where you're seeing that commitment to 0.4669 coming into play is the board two years ago said fine we will you know basically live by the rate so we we set that um, like commitment it's just a verbal commitment so I don't want you to think that there's an ordinance or a vote that took place it was just a commitment that we heard what the residents wanted and, and they wanted to know that the rate was going to stay the same so we set it and, and kept it at that we're on the same page as to how we've done this in the past and you know moving forward then as I think that's a good idea and I'd like to I'd like to continue the policy the unwritten policy uh, moving forward I, I think in today's economy if we can keep the the levy rate the same that's advantageous to the resident you know, even with the cost of living going up if the village can manage to keep the cost the same it's a savings to the resident well and to that point as uh, mrs Blockham pointed out um while we have while, while there uh, as far as the corporate account goes we actually will likely see a reduction admittedly modest but a reduction in what our property tax revenues uh, will be for uh, next year And one other side note, um, all of the property tax information is in the back of the village's audit now that we have a CAFR. Um, you can see a 10-year history of where our extensions have been and where our rates have been as well. So not only we show it graphically here, there's also that information within our audit as well. But if there's no other um, questions, you'll see this information again um, at the next village board meeting. Um, the other thing that I have in here just as a, a piece of information the biggest uh, component of a change for us uh, this year uh, not necessarily every year is the pension contribution that's within the proposed tax levy we had backup that was supplied to the board within your packet as far as the actuarial numbers that come to that uh, calculation so if there's any questions relating to that um, I'm not an actuary but I can speak to some of the numbers but um, 
All of those calculations are formalized annually, and they are also based on what state statute requires. So the $1.1 million that's being levied for police pension is based on two actuarial um, studies that have been done as well as what the state is requiring. So I felt the need to send that information to the board so you can look at that backup if you had any questions on it. You know, I probably would need to follow up with you if it's rule specific, but I wanted to see what was um, entailed as far as the calculation is concerned. The next item on the agenda is 2016-2017 draft fiscal year budget. <coughs> oh, okay. Okay. And we're going to start tonight with the police department. So, Brian, are you going to start or nope, you're, you're jump right in? You're right. Uh, uh, at this point, uh, we'll start with the police department, and then we will uh, return back to uh, uh, Mrs. Pleckham and, of course, Mr. Garrigan. Mrs. Devoney and I think Mr. Goska uh, will have a few words on uh, their respective departments, although Mr. Goska's is really uh, my modest, so more than likely he'll just be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, <laughs> so with that in mind, Ken, I don't mean to cut your presentation short, but uh, if, if you want to speak, <laughs> probably better just answer their questions. Um, with that, though, Chief Konopek has a presentation with regard to... Uh, the police department. I like Ken's approach. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Um, no, seriously though, I, I'd like to thank you the, for the opportunity to present our proposed budget. Um, in, in recent, uh, in light of recent incidents we've had a couple weeks ago, or within the last couple weeks, um, okay, is that um, maybe that's being blocked by the board there? Can you move the board back a little bit? No, the uh, that uh, right on your right there you go I think it's being blocked by the board or maybe not well could someone hit the uh, slide please um, as mentioned in re in light of recent a uh, couple recent uh, incidents we've had uh, within the last couple weeks uh, the first thing I want to do is let our residents know the visitors to our village and uh, the village board know that we still have a very, very safe community. Um, obviously, we, we had a couple uh, incidents that involved um, uh, injuries to people, um, more serious than that, obviously. Uh, but I want to let people know that the village of Plainfield is still a very safe place to be. Um, we are the 40, 45th largest community in Illinois, um, and there are uh, different uh, groups out there that rank the safety of communities in the state of Illinois and also on a nationwide basis. And based on some of the uh, feedback we've got, we've, we received throughout the year, uh, Plainfield is still ranked it, not just in the state as one of the safest communities, but also in the country. Uh, one blog in particular has ranked Plainfield as the 85th safest uh, community in the entire United States. So um, that's showing that really we, we do have a low crime rate and we have a very good community to live in. Um, we held the survey this year. We conducted a survey this past summer with our residents and other people that wanted to comment on the survey as far as the performance of the police department, how they thought we were doing, um, if they thought we needed an improvement, where we should uh, concentrate our efforts, things like that. And a couple of things that uh, came out of that survey, survey uh, two questions that we asked is what did the respondents feel that our, uh, the overall performance of the Plainfield Police Department uh, was? 75% of the respondents uh, indicated that uh, we were doing a uh, very uh, good job. Our overall performance was uh, very positive and above average. An additional 17% felt that our performance was an acceptable level. Even more important than that, uh, one of the questions they asked is how safe did, uh, and secure did people feel living in the village of Plainfield? And over 93% of our residents, or I should say respondents to the survey, felt that Plainfield was a very safe and secure community. So I just wanted to start out my presentation uh, with, with that slide to show that, again, we, we do have a very safe community. Next slide, please. Um, this slide indicates the crime index, and basically what it is is a rating of how many crimes we have, part one crimes. Part one crimes are basically crimes against persons. Um, as you can see, homicide, rape, robbery, aggravated assault or battery, burglary, theft, motor vehicle, arson, and some human trafficking things that fortunately we haven't had to deal with those at all. 
but then it gives you an overall percentage as far as your population versus the amount of uh, crimes uh, we've been experiencing in town as far as part one crimes. And as you can see, over the last several years, uh, we've been dropping dramatically as far as the uh, crime index. So the lower the crime index, the lower the number means the less crime that we're actually having, the less crimes against person in town. Um, last year we hit a uh, all-time low of 8.64. It has come up slightly this year. Obviously we don't have uh, the numbers throughout the remainder of the year yet. Um, we will compile those uh, once the year ends. But we have had a slight increase, but again, a very small increase. And even the number we're at currently is still significantly, significantly lower than where we've been in previous years leading up to 2015. So again, it shows that we do have a very safe community for people to live in. <clears throat> One of the challenges we are facing, though, within our department is the age of our department, the age of the officers that are working within our department. Uh, when I started here 20 plus years ago, we were one of the youngest departments in the entire state of Illinois. I think our average age at that time, our years of service, was uh, well below five years of service, and our average age was uh, in the uh, mid, low to mid 20s. Um, over the course of the years, which is a good thing, uh, almost every one of our officers has stayed with us for an extended period of time. However, with that happening, it means that our department has aged. Uh, significantly in those last 20 years. And as you can see by the, by the information that's up there, um, basically uh, within the next 10 to 15 years, now remember that uh, the, uh, early, the, the retirement age for an officer is 20 years of service. Um, they have to be 50 years old. Um, for most of our officers, there is a new standard now for new officers that are hired, but for almost every one of our officers, they have to be 50 years of age. So many of our officers are reaching that threshold. And in the next 10 to 15 years, there is a potential to lose up to 80% of our officers that we currently have working for our department. And the problem we face with that is we lose a lot of experience. Um, for the most part, we're handling a, a simple nuisance complaint. Um, pretty much a new officer can handle that. But in the event we do have a more serious uh, crime that occurs in town or even assisting another community with a serious crime that maybe comes through town or something like that, the experience of the officers, the officer or officers that are working that um, can't be measured uh, strictly in uh, just the age of the officer, uh, but it can be measured in the years of service. Uh, as an officer progresses in their years of service, they definitely pick up knowledge from previous calls that help, up, help them moving forward with, with uh, future calls, little things that maybe occurred in a call two, three years ago, four, five, six, seven years ago, they can use in a call that happens tomorrow. Um, and that's basically uh, pretty much throughout the police profession that you pick up things as you go along. And that experience, um, we, we send officers to a ton of training, uh, but that experience cannot be replicated in training. Um, the training just tells them how to do it, but that experience that they gather on the street uh, shows them you know, what is the best way to use the knowledge you have to help solve that crime. So that's one of the big challenges we face is the amount of experience that we potentially could be using, losing within the police department over the course of the next uh, several years. Next slide, please. Um, the next slide just shows the population of the village of Plainfield, how it's progressed in uh, roughly the last 20, 21 years, and the number of officers we've had, uh, which is basically an officer to population ratio. Um, the next slide you'll see um, the um, different standards that are out there basically put the recommendation at 1.8 officers per 1,000 uh, people population. Now for larger populations those numbers vary so your large cities such as Chicago, New York, Los Angeles they have a, a, a higher number than 1.8. Your really small departments such as uh, Rockdale, um, um, other small communities around our area um, they would also have a larger number but what we're considered as a medium-sized department our number is typically at that 1.8 threshold. And you can see over the course of the last 20 years that number has steadily declined. Um, our population has increased, our numbers of officers have increased, but that ratio has not remained the same. It's actually dropped um, to the where we're at currently, 1.21 officers per 1,000 uh, people. To next slide, please. And this graph here, um, we've surveyed uh, numerous departments, um, I believe there's about 20, 25 departments on, on this slide. There's other ones that we didn't include on this slide just because it would have 
really gotten too busy. Uh, but it kind of gives you an idea where we're at on the graph as compared to other departments throughout northern Illinois and specifically within our respective area. Um, as where the top red uh, arrow shows, actually the top red arrow is not showing on that slide, but um, it should be on the slide you have. Where the top red arrow is showing is we should, uh, the 1.8 would put it towards the top of that list, and the red arrow at the bottom is showing where our numbers currently are. Uh, the other thing uh, to take into consideration is we do have a unique community in the fact that we have four, three high schools and an alternative school. So although we do get uh, compensation for the officers that work those schools and I absolutely recommend uh, the SROs because they I'll talk about them a little later in the presentation they're a great addition to have in the school district that is for officers that we take right off the top as compared to some of these other departments that are taking one two or no officers um, off the top of their population or their uh, officer population so it kind of gives you an idea of where we are in the list as far as uh, ratio of officers compared to other communities in our area. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide shows our call volume over the last three years. Um, the, uh, the last graph gives you a projection that roughly we are looking at for our call volume to increase um, significantly over what it's been the last couple of years, um, roughly to the 36, over 36,000 uh, calls for service. Um, now, not all those calls are crime related. They could be, again, some nuisance complaints. They could be just um, calls that our, our community service officers are handling or uh, other people within the department, but they are still calls for service that we do have to respond to in whatever manner that call dictates. So it is showing a trend that uh, our numbers are going up a little bit. Additionally, our overtime costs are going up. Now this slide is very, very busy. I have broken out some of the things on it, uh, but basically this breaks out where most of our overtime costs for our officers go to. Um, we have about 10 or 12, uh, probably about 12 or 15 um, items on this graph, but uh, I'll break them out here uh, going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, the first one is call outs. Basically call outs are when we have uh, some type of incident where we have to call officers in from off duty, evidence technicians, uh, major crashes or other investigations that may be going on. Um, we did have a significant rise back in 2012 um, and then it dropped down, but now it's starting to steadily come back up again. Um, the projection for this year is increasing our numbers even more, putting us a little bit over $12,000 uh, as far as the number of officers we have to call out. Uh, the next one is court, basically Will and uh, Kendall County Court and local court. Uh, the cost for the officers, that's staying pretty consistent. Uh, there is a, a slight rise uh, projected this year, but for the most part, those numbers are staying consistent. It's helped, it has helped significantly that we've, over the last several years, we've had court at our police department, our local court, because that has saved a lot of the overtime costs of officers having to travel to downtown Joliet or other locations uh, as opposed to just coming to our police department. Next slide, please. Next slide is coverage. Um, this is the one slide that I really would like to point out. This is the slide that shows uh, where we've had to um, basically fill coverage within the patrol division uh, because of staff shortages over the course of this year. Um, back in 2012, um, well, I should say from 2012, I'm sorry, 2013 to 2015, our numbers have almost doubled. Uh, as far as the amount of overtime we've had to pay for coverage for officers having to fill in for shift for other officers that are off on uh, either vacation or FMLA or work-related injuries or things like that. So there's been a significant rise over the last couple of years because of um, the manpower shortages we have been experiencing within the police department. Uh, the next slide, uh, I'm sorry, the next, uh, stay on that last slide please real quickly. Uh, and then the bottom part of that is the special events. Um, this number has been going up just because the number of special events have been going up. Some of it has been uh, obviously attributed to salaries going up as well, but we are still, considering, uh, still continuing to see a rise in the number of special events that are coming to Plainfield. Um, they're great because they do bring people to the village of Plainfield, but again, the, these events, almost every one of these events, do uh, mandate that we have officers working anywhere from maybe one or two officers to uh, practically our entire department for some of our, our bigger events like our Plainfield Fest or our homecoming parade. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide shows our holiday pay. Um, there has uh, been somewhat of a drop over the last couple of years. Again, some of it may be attributed to the days that the holidays are falling on. Uh, but we are seeing a drop in the, in the holiday pay. 
uh, HIDTA, H-I-D-T-A, that's our, uh, th those are our drug task forces as far as the uh, officers that are working within them. Um, the nice thing about this slide is although there has been going up every year, most of that money is reimbursed or recouped through asset forfeiture or through the work that those officers do. So even though that number is going up, I did want to show it to you and explain it to you that most of that money, if not all of that money, is recouped back to the village. And just a couple more uh, overtime charts, and then we'll get back into some of the meat and potatoes. Um, other, I wanted to highlight this one because this was a, a, a big one on the overall slide. This indicates uh, things such as village hall details, um, other special events that we hold that are not um, uh, true special events, if you will, such as National Night Out, such as our, our D.A.R.E. events, um, some of the other community events like our hot dog nights that we have, some of the expos. Uh, that we send officers to to help promote safety and uh, different uh, programs within the police department. It's also things where we may be going to another agency to assist them uh, with an emergency call or some type of mutual aid uh, for a, uh, an event they have going on or things along those lines. Uh, and lastly, traffic. Uh, again, these numbers are going on, but um, some of these numbers, again, are recouped through grants, federal grants, um, that Sergeant Munson and the officers within our traffic unit are able to garner throughout the year. Some of the things like our DUI checkpoints, our seatbelt uh, safety details, things along those lines. So um, although these numbers are going up, most of these monies are recouped through uh, federal grants and other grants that are available out there. <clears throat> Now I'd like to break down the individual divisions that we have within the police department. Our first division is the uh, patrol, uh, which also includes the traffic division within our police department. Next slide, please. Um, some of the things we do there um, involve community events. These are pictures of different things that occur within our uh, within our um, uh, patrol and traffic division. Um, things such as training, um, community events, uh, seatbelt details. Um, demonstrations with our canine. Um, we also run our Explorer program through our patrol division. Um, traffic enforcement, as mentioned, is a big part of the patrol division. Um, although uh, the survey uh, came back that um, people, um, one of the things that people highlight in the survey is they felt traffic is still one of the biggest issues we have in town. And obviously, as anybody drives through town, especially with the construction still going on, we know that is an issue. So we do put a big emphasis on traffic, along with many of the other things that we do that I'll highlight as we continue to go forward. Next slide, please. Our patrol zones, uh, we currently have six patrol zones. The two far west, far west zones, Zone 5 and Zone 6, um, are not as populated. Zone 5 is. That's basically Grand Park and out in Kendall County area. Uh, zone 6 is mainly farmland with the roads that we've incorporated um, west and south of us. So they are large geographic areas, but there's not much population out there. Uh, but out uh, just overall the village, it is a large geographic area to cover. And as mentioned previously, with some of the, uh, during the daytime especially, with some of the traffic issues, it sometimes takes a while from an officer to go from one zone to another to answer a call for service. Um, it's something we try to reduce as much as possible, but with an area uh, stretched out as the village is um, and these zones uh, as populated with the traffic and that, it sometimes does take, a, take us an extended time to get from wherever that officer is to that respective call for service. Um, this is basically just another breakdown of our uh, calls for service. Um, it's broken down by our zones. As mentioned, we do have six zones. Uh, there are a couple monikers on top that cover calls for service where we have to go outside the village or for whatever reason they're not able to be fit into one of the zones or other. Uh, but basically, um, you can see over the course of the last few years, the numbers have stayed somewhat consistent, but as I showed in that previous slide, uh, it appears that our numbers will be going up by the end of this year as they are trending up a little bit. And as I mentioned, uh, aside from the visible part with the uh, patrol officers on the street, the most visible part of our, of our department, um, traffic enforcement and our traffic division is one of the most, um, uh, most uh, 
well-used uh, divisions or uh, sections within our department because of the amount of traffic issues we do have in town. At any respective time, we might be handling upwards of 25 different problem areas within the village that Sergeant Munson and the folks within his division are handling from speeding complaints to uh, not stopping at stop signs, traffic lights, uh, things along those lines. And even though some of those complaints uh, maybe end up becoming unfounded, it may just be a person's perception or you know, it may just be that one car that is driving through there, and we're just not catching that one car. It is still this. This still it does still mean when a complaint come in comes in, we do still have to go out there and send officers out there to see if there actually is a problem, and if there is, to try to uh, correct that problem uh, and get those people to comply with the traffic laws. Um, and our traffic unit over the years has garnered state and national awards. Um, again, going up with uh, communities like uh, the Los Angeles Police Department, the Illinois State Police, and other communities well, well bigger than uh, the Village of Plainfield. And we have always come out on top uh, going up head-to-head -head with those communities or those police agencies uh, because of the dedication and the uh, education and programs that our traffic officers have put together uh, to make sure that traffic going through, the plain, through, through Plainfield is as safe as possible. Uh, some of the things our traffic officers do, as mentioned, are speeding vehicles, impaired drivers, truck enforcement, occupant restraint, and railroad safety. Um, we are, unfortunately, and this is not a hit on CN, it just happens to be the geography of our area, we unfortunately are one of the busiest communities as far as the number of crossings that we have with trains in town. And obviously the board is aware and anybody watching on TV is aware of the issues we've been having with trains over the last several years. And I think uh, we're getting some remedies to that because of the work we've been doing, the village working with uh, CN. Um, but it is still an issue that we have to address because of the amount of crossings and the impact that those trains do have on traffic in town. Um, DUI arrests are a big thing that we do concentrate on. Our numbers have gone down slightly um, over, the last, uh, over the last year or so. Um, traffic crashes, um, we're also starting to see an increase on that, although it doesn't show on the slide. Um, our numbers projected for right now um, do show those traffic crashes starting to trend up a little bit. And I'll talk a little bit more about our traffic unit here in a few minutes as we move into personnel. As far as patrol division, although, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we are looking to stay uh, pretty much status quo, uh, if we did have the opportunity to get any additional bodies within our department, we would look to assign those two officers. We would ask for two officers. We would look to assign them within a, a, a cover position uh, which basically is a uh, shift that covers both the day shift and night shift. It covers our peak areas, um, basically where uh, we're feeling the we're seeing the most uh, incidents happening during that time frame. Um, it would help again with our response times during those peak periods, having additional personnel on the street. Uh, it would also help with our overtime. It would help reduce some of the overtime with our staffing requirements. Uh, and it also, in the event we are having a, a specific problem area. Uh, we potentially could take those extra officers and put them into some type of problem-oriented uh, position temporarily that we could address maybe that problem property or that uh, area where we're having concern in the neighborhood or whatever it may be for a uh, temporary uh, period of time. Um, a couple, one other thing I want to point out, and I have mentioned this previously, is the one um, unique thing within law enforcement is when you hire a police officer, it's not like in many other professions where you hire a person one day and by Tuesday of three weeks from now, they're pretty much up and running in that position. When you hire someone to become a law enforcement officer, you kind of hope that they already have law enforcement experience because that would help eliminate them having to go to the police academy, which, an which is an extended period of time. If, unfortunately, they don't have that law enforcement experience, though, we have to send them through an entire process before they are viable and able to uh, patrol on their own uh, within the village. Uh, aside from the testing process, which is completed uh, by our police commission, um, once the person is hired, again, if they're not law enforcement, they have to attend one of the police academies around the state. Currently, we're using Salia out of College of DuPage, but that is an extended program. That program goes for uh, 10 weeks, I'm sorry, 12 weeks. Um, once they're done there, then they still have to come back to us and do more field training. Even if the officer is already a law enforcement certified uh, 
uh, member, it's he still has he or she still has to go through that 14 week field training program. Now, obviously, if they're familiar with the if they're if they're a good hire and they're familiar with the laws, familiar with Village of Plainfield, hopefully we can maybe extend that or I'm sorry, speed that up that process a little bit to reduce that 14 week. Uh, field training for a sworn law enforcement officer as long as they're hitting the standards we have within our field training program. If they are not, then we will stay with the 14-week program. But again, if we're hiring someone that has no law enforcement experience, I can tell you we're taking that whole 14 weeks so that we make sure that they understand the laws, they understand our policies and procedures, they understand what it means to go out there and patrol the village of Plainfield. So with that being said, you're, you're talking about a 12-week program for the police academy. You're talking about another 14-week program uh, for our field training. Um, in theory, if we, if we hired, if the board allowed us to hire someone at the beginning of the budget year in 2016, May 1st, or roughly around there of 2016, because of the way the academy's fall and everything, we would not be looking for that new officer. If they're not already certified, we would not be looking for that new officer to hit the streets solo until actually 2017. So we're looking, we're basically talking a year and a half almost from right now for us to hire a new officer um, if we're waiting till that budget year starts. So that is a unique process within law enforcement that does take such an extended period of time. It is, a, it is a very good process because we can vet out people that really shouldn't be in here, but we can also make sure that they are trained to our standards, the standards that we set for every one of the members of our department to make sure that they can serve the citizens and the people that come through our town to the standards that we've set for our, for our department and our village. So although it is an extended process, it's something that we would not waver on as far as making sure they go through that. Next slide, please. The next slide just highlights our shifts. Um, the red markings on there where it says new officers, where we would propose to put those two cover officers. Um, I will t uh, also direct your attention towards the bottom where it says traffic unit. Um, we have a couple officers that have stars behind their names or asterisks behind their names. Um, the reason we, I highlighted those is I wanted to point out to the trustees that because of the staff shortages we've been having currently, um, thankfully we are starting to get some of those officers back. But with the staff shortages we're having currently, those officers with the asterisks behind their name actually have been reassigned to regular patrol duties. So in effect, our traffic unit has been cut in half. And in, in, uh, this is actually a good slide right now. If you would have seen this slide about two months ago, it would have been, even, we basically didn't have a traffic unit two months ago because that's how short staff we were, again, with work-related injuries, FMLA, and things like that. Uh, we were actually at the point where we had to cancel some in-house training because we just did not have the people to uh, to go through the training and still cover our patrol uh, coverages. So we had to reschedule that training. It's going to be coming up here in the future. Uh, but just, just highlights where we would put those cover officers and how it would highlight um, where the officers would uh, be placed within our patrol division. Next slide, please. Um, within the patrol division itself, um, outside of personnel, we are seeking three new vehicles. Uh, basically, they would place vehicles that are uh, already um, vehicles that have uh, going towards the end of their uh, life expectancy. Um, as we've talked about previously with other vehicles, uh, any of those vehicles that we would take out of patrol, we would try to use in other divisions in the department that maybe wouldn't have the wear and tear if the vehicles are still viable, or the other option would even be to hand them down to Pima where we could get some, hopefully get some years of use out of them over there as well. Um, but obviously if the vehicle's in that bad a condition, then we would send it directly to auction. So we would be looking for uh, three vehicles to replace uh, vehicles that are aging in our fleet. Um, and also we would be looking to update our live scan. What live scan is is basically our fin fingerprinting machine uh, that in the old days, Obviously, we had the uh, pink and pad, where, or the ink and pad, where you'd run the thumbs and the fingers across, and everybody ends up with uh, darkened fingers and that. Well, now we have the live scan machine, where basically you just put, put their hand on there, and their fingerprint and their palm print go right to the Bureau of, Identific Bureau of Identification in downtown Joliet, and we can get almost immediate feedback as far as who that person is, um, if they have warrants or anything like that, especially if they may be lying to us about their identity and things like that. So we would be looking for an upgrade to uh, the software for that machine as well. Within our community service division, our community service division is actually our most diverse, diverse division within our police department. If it covers anything from full-time sworn personnel 
to uh, civilian personnel to volunteers. So it truly covers the entire spectrum of, uh, of different things that we have going on within the police department and uh, ancillary to the police department. Next slide, please. Um, some of the things, um, as you, as you uh, may have seen in the previous slide, is we big part is school crossings. We have our school crossing guards, and we have our community service officers. Uh, I can tell you every year we are doing tens of thousands of school crossings. And because of the professionalism of our crossing guards and the uh, great work that our community service officers do, I am happy to say that since we've started the, uh, the uh, crossing, or since we've taken over crossing guard duties back in the, I believe it was the mid-90s, we have never had an incident at a crossing uh, anywhere in the village of Plainfield. And over the course of that 20 years, I can tell you we're, I, I haven't counted the children, but I would bet we're probably approaching close to 100,000 kids we've crossed in those 20 years without one incident or crossing. So I'm very proud to report that. Other things that we have in community service is we do have our chaplain program, which are volunteer chaplains that assist our officers in the event they have a traumatic experience or something going on where they need assistance, or the public, um, potentially a domestic situation or some type of death notification or something in between where a resident may ask for some type of uh, spiritual assistance or just some type of assistance with uh, counseling or, or things like that. The chaplains will come in and help direct them uh, to different services that are available throughout the county. Um, our code enforcement um, division, um, the nice thing about our code enforcement division is alongside with our, our regular police department, our code enforcement division, along with the building department, the planning department, really ensure for the quality of life here in the village of Plainfield. It is not just the uh, police department that works on quality of life issues. It starts with our planning department. They help bring in the right type of business or residential neighborhood, whatever it may be to the uh, village, our building department, that then make sure those buildings are being built properly. And then once those buildings are built, our code enforcement makes sure that those properties are being maintained to the standards that we expect within our ordinances. So it's really a, a trifecta, if you will, of those three groups working together to make sure that quality of life is present here in the village of Plainfield. If we see one of those areas start swaying off and they're not doing their job, or making sure that they're meet that the property is meeting the standards, then you lead to a whole bunch of different issues. That respective property is going to cause issues, and that in turn will probably lead to other issues starting up in that neighborhood or that area where that proper that problem property is located. So it's really a great relationship, working relationship that we have with the other entities, including the fire district as well. Um, as I mentioned, our community service officers they not only do school crossings, but they handle a wide variety of uh, service calls that maybe our officers can be free to do other things such as animal complaints, parking complaints, um, broken down vehicles, or if it is an emergency incident, they can come out, help do traffic control um, if while we're maybe waiting for our emergency management agency or in lieu of emergency management if it is that big of an event or incident going on, um, our community service officers help out. And as you walked in, you seen one of them uh, standing by helping here at the Village Hall for one of these special events uh, we have going on tonight. And then a big part of community service is the special events that we have throughout the community. Um, I will tell you, and Commander Ruggles sitting behind me, um, when he started here, he used to have a full head of hair because of, uh, it's not because of special events, that, that's just a joke, but, uh, uh, but I will tell you, um, from when I used to do community service to what he's doing today, we have many more special events that uh, require his attention. We can't just sign off on these things. They require safety plans. They require traffic plans. They require logistics plans for every one of these special events that are coming through town. So it's really a great effort that him and the other folks in community service work towards working with again other divisions, the fire, excuse me, the fire department and everything to make sure those those events go off without a hitch and make sure that everybody is safe during those events. And also our dare uh, program is within community service. Um, our D.A.R.E. program just had their dance-a-thon this past Saturday. We had several hundred kids showing up uh, to our dance-a-thon. It's really the early age where you can get that message out about the dangers of drugs. Uh, again, an incident or an event that we had within the last two weeks show that drugs are, are available or are present in our village with our heroin uh, uh, arrest that we made. Um, I think... Their program is a very significant way to get the message out to those kids be while they are still able to understand the message and hopefully before they get to those teenage years that really marijuana, heroin definitely, cocaine, those other drugs, and even alcohol for that matter 
Um, alcohol, obviously, used in in in, in uh, moderation if you're legal age, but definitely the drugs. You know, they're really not the way to go if you want to become successful in life. Um, next slide just co shows our community service officers their service, uh, their amount of calls that they handle. Over 10,000 calls for service uh, just in just in the one year. Um, so they are very busy out there. I've talked about some of the things that they uh, handle as far as animals, parking, things along those lines. Our code enforcement division, I talked about this as well. Um, we were fortunate enough to create a second full-time position within the last few months. Um, and they stay active as well. The vast majority of them are the grass and weeds complaints um, that the uh, code enforcement division handles. Those will be dying down now, but they will continue to work throughout the months on those property maintenance issues. And within the community service division, um, basically what they're asking for is just dues and subscri scri subscriptions increases. Excuse me. I've obviously been talking too long if I'm drying out. Um, just dues and subscriptions increases for our, just another hour? Okay. It's only the bears. They're not that good anyway, so. Um, for our new code enforcement officer, um, our radio maintenance um, with our Starcom radios, they are starting to get older. They're older generation, so we are working to transition them out. And uh, capital purchases would be two vehicles that we would request. Uh, one is a replacement for an aging community service vehicle, and one is a replacement for Commander Ruggles. With the things he does with the special events, and also uh, most especially with uh, Pima, with the uh, emergency response, the weather spotting, and everything in, in between with Pima, we are asking for a larger vehicle for him to help carry additional equipment for incident command. Um, some traffic control uh, devices for Commander Ruggles, similar, uh, maybe not quite as extensive, but similar to what I carry in my vehicle that we could pop out and we can set up an incident command post almost immediately wherever it may be. So that larger vehicle would be asked for, for Commander Ruggles for those special events and emergency purposes. I'm sorry? Yes, the VW bug. Yes, absolutely. Only 34 more slides to go. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, our last division is our administration. Our administration uh, basically covers a couple areas. Um, it covers investigations or our detectives. It covers our records area, uh, more than a couple areas. It covers our school resource officers. And it also covers our property and evidence uh, area as well. Um, our school resource officers, as I mentioned earlier in my program, they are a great asset. They are compensated. Uh, we are compensated through the school district for those officers, but they are a great asset uh, for our officers to work with the students and with the staff of the school district. We've been able to head off a lot of things that go on out in the streets or out in the public because of information that we've gathered at the school and vice versa, information that our officers have gathered on the street, they've been able to re relay to school resource officers um, on specific incidents and they've been able to solve crimes because of the re relationship they have with uh, students in the school. And we've also worked with other schools, Plainfield South, that obviously we know is in the city of Joliet, but, all, but in the Plainfield School District, we've been able to work with their liaison over there and help solve some crimes that have been overlapping uh, jurisdictions as well. So they are very busy. Not only do they do the crime prevention or the crime solving, if you will, but they also teach classes, believe it or not, in the schools. They teach them driver's ed assistance classes. They also teach them classes uh, related to different things of uh, policing and, and law enforcement and uh, legal issues within the school district. So they're not only police officers, but they're also quasi-teachers while they're in the school as well. And when not in the summer times when they're not uh, working in the schools, they do assist us, in a, assist us in a variety of different areas, help supplement our, our personnel in the summertime uh, within different areas of the police department. Our records division, very diverse. They do a huge cross-section of things. Um, although their primary duty is obviously uh, court fi or filings, um, taking care of case management, things along those lines, they also do the registration for our sex offenders and our violent offenders that may live in the village. Uh, they do freedom of information uh, requests. Any walk-ins, they're the ones that handle those walk-ins at the front window. Um, obviously phone calls that they answer, solicitor permits, um, any type of uh, uh, request through 
um, uh, any type of, uh, I'm sorry, FOIA requests, any type of uh, requests for other data from our police department, um, those are the people and records that handle that. And additionally, Sergeant Myers, who runs the records division, oversees our CALEA, the accreditation program for our village. We have now, uh, we are now in another process to get uh, recertified. We've been in CALEA for five years, and I can tell you it has raised the standards within our department. Because of us joining CALEA five years ago, we've been able to make sure that all our policies and procedures are up to speed as far as where they should be. And I can tell you we've been fortunate that um, we have not had a, a major incident like many other communities around the country have had to face. And I, I knock on wood that we never do, but I will tell you that two of the first things that uh, they will take a look at if we do have an incident like that is your training and also your policies and procedures to see what you have written. And I can tell you by maintaining the CALEA certification, I, we, have, we have backup that shows that our policies and procedures meet the nationwide standard um, so I know we can we could uh, we can argue that with anyone that our policies and procedures are not up to, up to where they should be. Um, our administration division is asking for one vehicle this year. Um, basically, it would be a SUV that would be a, uh, assigned to one of our detectives. Um, our detective, that detective, is assigned to the Kendall County Special Response Team, which is their SWAT team. So we would ask for a larger size vehicle so he could take uh, his SWAT equipment with him. To, uh, if there is a call out in Kendall County or even in Plainfield for that matter. Unfortunately, we do have uh, on occasion calls that uh, resemble where we may need a SWAT presence. Um, he would be able to respond quickly to the scene with all his equipment there uh, and would uh, eliminate any type of delay as far as responding to that violent offender that's on the other end of that call. And the last couple slides uh, for Plainfield Emergency Management Agency. As we're all aware, unbelievable group of volunteers for the last 15 plus years um, dedicating thousands of hours to this village volunteering thousands of hours to this village helping with special events emergency preparedness incident response um, traffic control at major incidents they're so uh, renowned that members of their department are act, asked to go to other communities to help them with search for missing uh, persons. They responded to Oswego just last week to help with a uh, missing autistic uh, child that was missing that they fortunately were able to find. Uh, they responded throughout northern Illinois and in the central Illinois because of the expertise of the members of Pima. Uh, we've also responded as a agency to other disaster sites, because, again, because of our expertise and our knowledge, such as Coal City, uh, such as Washington uh, several years ago, and other communities, uh, even to the Mississippi River years ago for flooding they had. Uh, we've responded to all those areas because of the expertise of the members of our emergency management agency. <clears throat> and additionally, they also uh, run the CERT program. Members of our EMA run our CERT program, which is an additional 200 volunteers that help our community in the event we have a major flood, we have, uh, a, unfortunately, another tornado comes through town or anything in between. We have that cache of 200 volunteers that could come out and help us uh, with ever, whatever that incident is. For EMA, next slide, please. Uh, for EMA, they're just looking for an increase in dues and subscriptions, uh, some temporary shelter and supplies increase to replace some of the aging personal protective equipment we have, such as masks, gloves, um, things along those lines. Again, upgrading our radio system. Some of our radios are getting older generation. And also our siren maintenance. Currently, <clears throat> our village has over 90% coverage of our tornado sirens or our warning sirens. Most of those last 10, less than 10% area is farmland um, that is not occupied or populated right now, but at some point it will be. So our goal is at uh, some point to strategically move a couple sirens that maybe are a little too close to each other, working with our contracting company to get that 100% coverage around the village. Again, it's no hazard right now because the areas we've identified are not populated, um, but we would strategically like to move a couple sirens just to make that 100% coverage. And lastly, our police commission. The only thing the police commission um, is asking for is just to maintain their status quo. We are going to be uh, conducting uh, sergeant testing again later in 20, uh, 2016. So they will need those funds in there to conduct the testing for those sergeants. Chief, there is one thing you forgot to mention under the uh, Pima uh, budget, and that is that you were looking for a new uh, weather system. 
so they didn't have to have an indoor weather system where they knew it was raining just by standing inside their building? That is correct. Is that correct? Yeah. That is correct. Um, one, one of the training classes we do put our Pima folks through is they have to stand under one of the holes in our garage and determine if it's raining outside or not. So, <laughs> yes, that, that is correct. I, I, would, uh, I would be remiss, remiss if I didn't mention that. Um, with that being said, though, does anyone have any questions about anything I presented? I have a few. If, uh, comment first. Uh, your report's uh, extremely comprehensive. It shows that you have a fantastic grasp of what your organization ought to do, ought to be doing, and it actually does. So, uh, it's very well done. Uh, since we were forced to kind of uh, go through the pension stuff, I have a couple pension questions. Uh, do we can, it's hard to tell from the paperwork that we had to read uh, how healthy we are. I know a lot of organizations are much worse than we are. Are we comfortable that uh, our pension situation is being handled? The percentage funded uh, un is going down just a hair, but we're not concerned about that, I gather. No, we're not concerned. And actually, um, the funding mechanism, the actuarial calculations that we fund for is at 100% funding based on the actuarial um, calculations that we get. The state only requires that municipalities fund at 90%. So where I'm going with that is that we're funding over what the state's requiring from year to year, which will in essence bring our funding percentage up a lot quicker than a lot of municipalities in the area. And there are several publications out there as well that do rate the different pensions throughout the state, both police and fire, and the village of Plainfield. I can't speak for the fire side, but uh, for the police department itself, we are near the top um, as far as the rating for our pension. Okay, it's hard to tell that from the paperwork I was seeing, but I'm glad to hear that. That's why I need that kind of insight. Uh, you have very little turnover. In fact, if, as long as I've been on the board, I can only recall maybe six or seven years ago somebody left, but last number of years, nobody has left. We, we've been very fortunate that way. Wow, which is very good. But the question is, if somebody does leave, is the pension portable? The, re the way I read the document, you got to be one place. I don't know that's portable to another police department uh, or not. I'm just curious about that. It is. It is portable. It is portable. Mm -hmm. okay. They have to a apply and request that it move to the department that they're moving to. But it, it's there's portability within the pension. Uh, You're very eloquent on your desiring for everybody to be trained, and you certainly are doing a very good job of that. It clearly is an investment in the future. And uh, I supported last year the logic by which you need to get some staff, and I hope we can come up with it this year. The one question I guess I have is how much does it cost to add a single person? Because you have not only a salary, you got the benefits, you got the pension, in addition to the pension liability or the need, and so on. So, what is the cost per person? Do we have a handle on that yet? We, we use about $150,000 yeah. as the estimated cost to do the training and uh, begin with their salaries right. and, and get them to uh, uh, benefits. So it's about $150,000. Does that include the pension part of it, too? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. That's the end of my questions, but thank you. Very nicely done. Um, you have a, in the hiring process, do we just go off of a standard eligibility list, or do you have a separate list for lateral transfers that you can pick from? Now, our commission has decided just to stay with that single list. Now, a, as you're aware, we can jump down the list if there is a sworn officer on that list. Have we done that in the past? Uh, actually, we did it with our last hire, yes. I, uh, I noticed the, uh, there's a large percentage of school resource officers, a large percent of the, de of the department is the school resource, the detectives, the traffic, and um, I'm wondering what the level of compensation back from the school district is as far as salaries for the, the four school resource officers are. Is it a percentage wise of their salaries? I believe 50 uh, percent, correct? I believe it's 50 percent. Does that include the vehicles as well and the use and the insurance and all that, or is that just the straight Just salary? Just the salary. Have uh, anybody looked at anything, uh, the, the total cost of the CALEA program? You know what the total cost as far as the administration of it, the salaries of the individuals involved, and if, when you get that number, have they looked at any other training? Um, I can tell you right now we're, we're in what's considered the maintenance part, um, so the cost is a lot less. When we started the program back in 2008-9 to get to that 2010 initial certification, the cost was a lot more significant. It was... Uh, 
I want to say roughly fifteen, sixteen thousand uh, dollars at that time to get up to the Calia standard for the first time. At this point, um, as I mentioned, we're in a maintenance uh, cycle, so it's roughly four thousand dollars per year for the maintenance. Now this year, there's an additional cost because we are up for reaccreditation, so we do have to actually go to the conference and sit in front of a panel, and they'll ask us about our policy and procedures. Um, they they do send people in as a mock assessment, and from that mock assessment, they'll ask us questions. So we do have to physically go to the conference to basically defend our position. So there is an additional cost this year. Um, from there, the accreditation is every four years, so that cost won't uh, be any more than four years. Um, I, I have not broken down the cost as far as what S Sergeant Myers does. I will tell you, prior to our manpower, uh, manpower downshift a few years ago, we actually had uh, almost two people doing that position. We had someone that was strictly dedicated as an accreditation manager, and then we had a, a deputy chief that was working with that accreditation manager to assist in uh, getting us to that CALEA accreditation. So Sergeant Myers effectively is, is kind of doing the work of those two people that no longer exist within our department. Um, but I have not uh, calculated what cost uh, or what her salary is uh, as far as the CALEA part of it, no. Okay, has the Village of Plainfield looked at any other training or uh, evaluation process besides CALEA to uh, compare costs? The only other accreditation that we're aware of is the Illinois Chiefs has, has an accreditation program. Uh, we did look at that. We actually looked at it uh, when, we, when we originally were going to CALEA. At that point, uh, their system or their program was in uh, kind of an infancy stage, if you were, so we went with CALEA. Um, we, <clears throat> although Illinois Chiefs has a very good program as well, um, I'm familiar with it. We strongly suggest staying with CALEA because they actually search or they actually require that more policies, more standards are passed than uh, the Illinois Chiefs. Additionally, the other benefit we get from CALEA is they actually have uh, a, a networking system. It's called IPAC. It's a networking system with all the CALEA agencies throughout the country. So if we have an issue going on here in Plainfield with a policy or um, even something down the road like body cams or something like that, we can reach out through this networking system and basically touch base infinitely to however many CALEA agencies are out there to get their policies and procedures or get feedback from them on what worked for them, what hasn't worked for them, things like that. So that's an additional benefit that the Illinois Chiefs, from my uh, knowledge, does not have available to them. Um, we have we have basically compared the two and the cost of the Illinois Chiefs. There is still a cost. I believe it's uh, roughly a thousand dollars, maybe a little bit more than that. So it's a few thousand, a couple thousand dollars more than what our maintenance costs would be for Kalia. But again, for the the benefit we're getting from Kalia, I, I think it, I would strongly suggest we do stay with the Kalia process. I noticed that we have what four four dare officers, and that's the highest in any. They're tied for the highest with Buffalo Grove out of any departments in the area. School, school resource officers, not their oh, officers. Oh, sorry, school resource officers. Yes. Can you uh, explain a little bit more what a school resource or resource officer does for the people who are watching? Basically, a school resource officer is assigned to the school throughout the entire school year. Um, during those months where school's out of session, we do have uh, auxiliary duties for them, either patrol or helping with investigations or property or anything else within the police department. But during that roughly nine months that the school resource officers in the school, they're basically acting as a uh, police uh, a uh, small community police officer, if you will. They're taking care of all the problems that are going on within that high school that they're assigned to, and they're also taking care of the way the school district, Plainfield School District, is set up is they have what's called different colored houses. So, for instance, Plainfield North, East, Central, South is in Joliet, but each one of those high schools have middle schools that are assigned to them. So our SROs are also assigned to those schools. So they're not only taking care of the uh, incidents that are going on at the high schools, they're also taking care of the incidents that are occurring at their uh, adjoining middle schools in their respective areas. Now our DARE officers take care of the uh, things that go on in the elementary schools. But as I mentioned earlier, aside from any criminal element that's going on, they actually even teach classes in there, um, legal type classes, traf uh, classes related to traffic safety, driver's education, um, other, uh, other classes that may be asked of them by the uh, teachers that they're qualified to, uh, to instruct. Um, some of them are safety classes. They also work with the school district on their safety plans. They meet with the principals, deans, and that throughout the school year to make sure that they have safety plans in place. And they're also working uh, with the surrounding neighborhoods, um, not deep into the neighborhoods, but working with the surrounding neighborhoods on traffic-related issues. They work with our traffic unit on issues with parents coming and going, pickups, things like that. So it's not strictly confined to the structure of the building itself. It actually extends beyond the respective building that they're assigned to. 
Um, and I can tell you that uh, because of their presence in the school, they basically free up our zone guy, our zone people, um, that they don't have to respond to the school unless it's maybe transporting someone that's been uh, arrested for disorderly conduct or something like that. Absent that, those zone officers never have to address any issues in those schools because those school resource officers are taking care of those concerns. Right, and the last question I had is, the DARE officers, since they work with the schools, are, is there any part of their salary um, recovered by the village from the school district at all? Not the DARE officers, no. Thank you. I'm sorry, I, I always have questions, I guess. So I guess first, I just wanted to say the first slide was very impressive. Um, obviously seeing the respondents from the residents and also the rating, safety rating. So kudos to you, Chief, and to your department. Thank Great you. Great job. Thank you very much. Um, and a couple questions, I guess. So there was talk about, you know, the, and the need for additional officers. And obviously when you look at the salary, the overtime is, and you went through and explained some of that. So do you think by hiring either one or two of those officers, what do you have any estimate as to how much you might be able to eliminate or reduce some of that overtime? I don't have a, a specific number. Um, I will tell you any addition to our department will reduce that number, though. Um, maybe not significantly, but we should hopefully see a reduction. Now, knock on wood, that's contingent on hopefully our officers don't getting hurt or, or things like that, like ex the extension we've seen this summer with the number of officers. But, again, any addition of personnel to our department should see that number starting to be reduced. And then um, I, I wasn't sure what the other trustee was asking regarding the list or whatever, but maybe it goes along with this question. So some of the community police officers, would they be available or would they be open to if you were going to hire that actually that might be a promotion for some of those officers are they eligible to do that or is that they, they would have to go through the same testing process as everybody right. else yes and then the dare program is that is that strictly the full-time dare program for those officers or do they do other responsibilities as well they do other responsibilities they teach dare classes uh, but they also are community resource officers so if we have um, an issue in town, a, a safety issue. Um, for instance, especially around the holidays, they'll work around the 4th of July with the fireworks safety and things like that. They will work with different groups in town with the fire district to help promote fireworks safety um, around, excuse me, around different holidays around town. Uh, they will work, uh, they actually take care of uh, advising the mayor on our different liquor establishments in town as far as um, applications or as far as problems that we are, thankfully, we don't see a lot of problems, but on occasion we maybe see a problem pop up at one of our liquor establishments. They'll advise the mayor as far as what the incident was that occurred, if there's any corrective action that maybe we want to take. Um, they also teach our Bassett training, so they make sure that every one of our liquor servers, including the ones that work our special events, our Plainfield Fest and, and things like that, are certified to identify uh, one person when a person is consuming too much alcohol. Um, and as I mentioned, as a community resource officer, uh, they work with uh, homeowners if they have questions as far as how do I secure my house, how do I make, make my house safer. Um, they've worked with them. They work with the, uh, the homeowners associations in town as far as doing uh, safety briefings with them. So they do a wide variety of, aside from just the DARE itself, they do a wide variety of public safety and public relations things throughout the community. And then um, another question you were talked about during the last few months that one chart would have even looked worse as far as the traffic um, the patrol division and with the additional officers or officer would that also help that situation as well in the future yes it, um, thankfully some of the officers that we currently have off are starting to come back but with those additional officers we would be able to re fully staff at least to the the level we have now we would be able to fully staff our, our traffic unit and with that being said they would be able to um, ident or not identify, but able to address those 25-some daily uh, traffic complaints we have around town more effectively than they're able to now. Which were for me and a lot of the residents I hear would be would be huge. So um, I think this would be the last question. Oh, I'm sorry, two more. Sorry. So ma in the one of the budgets, it talks about maintenance contracts slash lease, and and then vehicle maintenance is below that so I'm guessing that's different than vehicle maintenance so what is maintenance contracts slash lease well depending on the department or the division you're looking at it could be for the building itself it could be contracts related to the, the copy machines that they have and leases for that um, just depending on which division you're looking at but that's usually what is encompassed other under the contracts itself 
and the last one it talks about I think if I'm looking at this right so under the seizure forfeiture it says it talks about is that an expense it's a pass-through so the revenue is represented within our general fund revenue and then anything expended there's a legal restriction on how those monies can be spent then it, it passes through so it, it's preliminary a wash between the revenue and expenditure items um, and depending on the year is up to the chief's discretion on the needs and what actually can be expended from year to year within that um, seizure money okay but that Typically, that's money. Am I understanding? Is that that's money typically coming into the department, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. To that end, I don't. Uh, thank you, Chief, for your presentation, uh, Mrs. Pleckham. Do you have the n numbers for that department? Mm -hmm. I know uh, uh, Trustee O'Rourke was asking some questions, but uh, uh, specific line items, but. I think you are going to cover quickly uh, each of those um, uh, department uh, costs. Correct. Right? Um, the chief highlighted some of the specific areas within each division that um, there are slight increases or changes within the request for budget. But in your packet, you should have the police division summary, um, which encompasses all of the police department as well as Pima and police commission. Uh, the total requested amount is t just over $12 million. It's a 2.8% increase from the current adopted budget that we're working with today. Keep in mind that includes an increase of $150,000 in police pension monies that go to the pension fund. Um, you'll notice within almost every classification, there's actually a reduction within the budget itself. The two areas that have increased primarily our salaries and benefits, which is standard. That's the d the standardized um, salary incre increases related to union contracts as well as the civilian employees, as well as the benefits relating to uh, the insurance uh, estimates, the increases within the insurance that comes through. Um, so generally speaking, it's, it's somewhat of a flat budget across all divisions. Um, I'd be happy to go through any questions that the board may have within the, each of the divisions uh, at this time or at any time throughout the throughout the budget process. Again, this is the, the first draft of this bu budget. Some of the points that we've looked at, specific to new hire possibilities, we'll revisit along the next few months, depending on the revenue estimates that we have, as well as looking at expenditures, things such as overtime, things of that nature. We've already um, met a few times in relation to some of the expenditures and have come to a very, very um, tight budget uh, as it relates to today. Um, but again, some of those overtime costs can be looked at if we were to implement new hires. Uh, I don't know that it would be 100%, but we'll continue those conversations in the next few months. Okay. Are there any other questions for uh, Chief Konopek or Mrs. Pleckham as it relates to the uh, police division? Okay. Moving along, as riveting as finance can be and administration, <laughs> um, we have a few less slides than the police department in some of these areas, but we will go through them and answer any questions that you might have um, on the screen. This is uh, the village's belief statement. I'd like to present that first within our, within our budget presentation. Uh, the first slide is in what's in your packet, we're going to follow through with what's in your packet, is a summary of our revenue and expense summary. The one thing that staff likes to do is present the global picture, especially when we're talking tax levy, um, looking to bring that forward by the end of December to have that levy in place. Um, you've already seen the streets division budget. Uh, you'll see the rest of the budgets uh, in the next few slides. This is the overall revenue summary. Uh, proposed revenue as it stands today, um, You'll see our, our adopted budget this year is at $22.5 million, and we're proposing $23.2 million for next fiscal year. Um, and again, the summary is on page one of that. F it should be the next um, pack piece of packet within, your, um, within what you have tonight. Pages two through four of that packet has the detail of the revenue um, as it stands currently, and we've talked about that a number of times based on where the state is today. Um, I'd like to turn to page two real quickly. Um, property tax revenue, we talked about a little bit um, as far as the proposed budget. You'll see the $1.1 million um, in, as revenue for the police pension purposes. You'll see the property tax revenue um, for corporate fund as $3.162 million, and that's a 30 roughly $30,000 reduction, 32000 based on what we're estimating to receive this current fiscal year. 
Um, income tax is probably the biggest driver of, of where we're at within our um, estimates for next fiscal year. As the board can see in the history, this current, this uh, fiscal 15, which was just approved through the audit process back in October, the village did receive just over 3.8 million in income tax revenue. To date, we're just about 2.9 million of received funds this fiscal year. The question becomes, what will the state do for the rest of this fiscal year as well as next fiscal year? Um, at this point, we're not comfortable with moving that revenue item up or even down. It's representing a 17% decline based on the 15 actual. So 3.172 million is where we're at today. Again, this is the one we're tracking the closest as it relates to the state. Use tax is another uh, state revenue. Um, we're keeping that one consistent with the current fiscal year. However, um, there's been less discussion at the state level that we're aware of on the use tax. I will tell you that we're starting to see delays in receiving these funds. Um, MFT, we have not received completely separate fund, um, but income and use tax, we are seeing delays on these funds. We have not received our use tax since August, and the income tax, we just received October's, I'm sorry, September's at the end of October. So they're, they're they're delaying. Um, if you recall, uh, probably back in 2007 or 8, there was a three-month lag in our income tax revenue um, for a long period of time. So we're watching that one closely. Um, one of the revenue sources that you'll see increase um, within the proposed budget is on page 3, and that is related to the garbage fee, and that's um, revenues related to waste management services. We have a contract with waste management. Um, the proposed budget reflects an estimate based on growth as well as the increase in the contractual service that is effective January 1. Other than that, um, every all the other line items are pretty straightforward, um, pretty consistent with this current fiscal year. I'd be happy to answer any questions on revenues that you might have at this time. And again, you'll see this come back um, a number of times, I'm sure. Moving on, we'll look at some of the expenses, some of those summary lines that we saw um, on the revenue side. We'll hit the divisions now. Uh, this is the divisions that we're talking about. You've already heard from the police now and also the streets department, which is housed within Public Works. Um, the first unit within in your, in your packet is the administration and finance unit. It encompasses the legislative program, administration, slash management services, community relations, uh, facility management, human resources, and IT. So in your packet, you have a summary of uh, admin and finance. That is uh, a total of $6.4 million in the proposed budget. It's an increase of about 3.3% or $200,000, just over $200,000. Page 2 reflects the um, legislative program as well as non-divisional, which is the refuse hauler fees. We house that within its own division to keep it separate. Legislative program is at f just over 500000 uh, That represents uh, s expenses relating to the elected officials, municipal dues, public relations, has some cable expenditures as well as far as the boardroom is concerned, um, and economic incentives. The administration program um, houses the uh, village clerk. Uh, and her duties, which is all of the media notices, the uh, who is official keeper of records, also FOIA requests, everything that she handles. Um, expenditures come through the administration program as well as the administrator's office and his functions. Um, and management services. And management services, uh, myself as well as the accounting supervisor, we also supervise the utility billing um, clerks. There's three although their funds are uh, directly expended through water and sewer, which we'll talk through in a future workshop, um, and as well as the front desk staff, which is um, two full-time equivalents, but it's, it's three people. Uh, just an example, uh, our accounting and finance section, obviously we do the financial reporting and the audits, tax levies, TIF reporting, um, investments, fixed assets, and debt management. Utility billing processes over 13,000 bills monthly. Um, comes out to about 160,000 transactions a year. So they've been busy. Um, I think last year they produced or initiated o just over th uh, 3,300 work orders. Um, as far as the proposed budget, you'll see within the slide and also within your packet, it's on page three. 
um, one point, just over 1.2 million, almost 1.3 million, um, fairly st status quo uh, f between this current and the proposed. Um, community relations is next, and I'm going to let Amy speak to her division's budget. Thank you, Tracy. Um, this slide highlights some of the things that community relations handles um, for the village. Um, that includes publicizing and promoting village news and events through a variety of sources, including social media, our village newsletter, the website, weekly news, e-news updates, um, and those things. Also, we handle the Settlers Park Concerts and Movies series. Um, we have three concerts and four movies every summer in Settlers Park. We also have an active sponsorship sponsorship series for that which this year we obtained four thousand dollars to help offset the cost of those events um, another item that community relations handles is the village website updates um, we have a couple new pages that we added this year to highlight current projects and current developments um, we also assist the economic development task force next slide thanks a um, couple new things that i wanted to highlight that we did in 2015 that were new um, we had the how-to fair this year, which was 50 free classes offered in one weekend. <coughs> the joint event sponsored with the Park District and the library. Um, we're already planning um, that for the new year and plan it for um, a little bit later in 2016 in November. We had um, over 400 people attend our first year. We also expanded our Hunger Action Month activities this year, which is held in September. We worked with the Northern Illinois Food Bank, the Chamber of Commerce, the library and the school district on that. Um, in 2016, there's a couple of new events planned. Um, we're working on and researching a potential electronics and household hazardous waste recycling service. We're gonna be offering an online survey to kind of see and gauge what our residents want and if they'd be interested in such a service in the coming year. We're also gonna be working on the strategic planning public meetings um, that'll be held in the late winter, early spring time. Um, and also working with Public Works on the Settlers Park refresh that we're going to be doing. Um, the good news is, is that we are continuing to see an increase in the visits, number of visits to our website, as well as the e-news subscribers. We're over 3,000 people now. We're approximately 2,500 likes on Facebook. And for Twitter, we have about 1,200 followers. And those are just for the village pages. We also maintain um, Facebook and Twitter accounts for both Public Works and the Police Department as well. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. You have on here something about a Settlers Park refresh. Tell us a little bit more yeah. about. Um, we're going to be uh, working with Public Works and um, kind of updating and refreshing some of the things out there. We have some pavers and concrete work and landscaping work that needs to be refreshed, spruced up as we did to downtown. I remember correctly there are some uh, memorials as well that will either be refreshing or there are some uh, private folks uh, seeking additional funds out in the community currently for those isn't that is that still true that is correct and we're looking to do that more than likely in in the spring the spring or the summer events start this would include uh, the bottom of May? It would, sir. April and May we have closed off to events in the park. Uh, community Relations Program budget is on page four of your handout in the budget documentation. Um, facility management is a newer program within administration. As you can see by the slide, fiscal 13 is when we um, started to bring this program together. We've seen a, a higher need for village hall maintenance and repairs and custodial work. We just found it necessary and we thought it was a little bit better representation of um, having this program as, as its own division. Um, this year is no different. Uh, within the budget you can see on page five that we're actually looking at a proposed budget which is slightly less than the adopted budget this year pretty much keeping status quo we did if the board recalls we did um, contract with the new custodial service uh, happy to say so far so good um, other than that it's pretty straightforward we've programmed as you can see on page five we've programmed salaries and benefits relating to the staff that actually works for 
um, this program. Um, they're actually public works employees that are helping assist over at Village Hall. So if we found it appropriate to um, program some of the salary and time that they spend over here for this purpose. Um, human resources would be the next um, budget within your packet. And so board's aware, uh, we have two individuals within our human resources division. Um, they deal with everything from payroll processing to um, recruitment at, at different levels, staff development, risk management, also handles our workers' comp and tort li liability, um, wellness programs as well. Um, the budget with that you see in front of you um, on page six uh, is moving from the current budget of 274000 to 279000 uh, primarily just an increase within salary, um, a slight decrease in benefits, just basically the, the different plans that the employees are choosing, that's all. Uh, information technology, um, the IT program, uh, as you can see on the slide, fiscal 13 was prior to consolidating the IT functions and under one uh, program, so you'll see the, that's the primary difference between where um, you see the expenditures that fiscal year to the proposed for fiscal 17. Um, IT helps across all divisions, all, all buildings, and in various ways. Um, GIS is probably the first uh, from this current division, or for this current fiscal year, we've brought that GIS position to a full time. It's been beneficial across every division um, in different ways, uh, but been very productive for us to have on staff. Um, support for hardware and software, including what's listed up on the screen. There's also been a move towards mobility. Um, we currently have 17 iPads uh, that we're working on uh, that they're keeping maintained and functioned for the village. Um, one thing within this current budget that you're looking at is the deployment of mobile inspections app for um, next calendar year, which is next fiscal year. And as the next slide shows a little bit, a little snapshot of what mobile inspections might look like, but all ultimately the inspectors We'll be able to route, schedule, and complete inspections all from the field. Um, the app will allow them to see inspection history, view permit information, capture photos, email contractors, and add notes right on the fly. So we're excited about this. Uh, we're looking forward to rolling that out in the next fiscal year. So the budget that you see um, on pages six as well as seven reflects uh, those costs as well. So that should be the end of the administration and finance unit. I don't know if there's any other questions. I'd be happy to field them at this time. Otherwise, we can move to the building program. Sorry, Tracy, can I interrupt mm -hmm. again? Sorry. No, absolutely. Um, so if you look at the 2014-2015, uh, I think there was a, a, a substantial transfer to capital, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And you look at the adopted 16 and, and beyond, and that transfer is gone. So I, I guess I'm just... And again, I'm not a finance person, so I say I, w I look at that and I say, okay, so we had the money in the past to be able to transfer it. What happened to the money this year that we don't have it to transfer, I guess? I think that last transfer, there was a $3 million transfer this year as well. It didn't reflect up on the slide. I'm looking at the page to see if it just didn't front forward. The last two years, the village um, transferred over $3 million each year. On page seven, you'll see the actual numbers, 3295000 which did not front to the front page and the transfer section. So that should add that that additional $3.2 right. so, million. So and obviously there was revenue somewhere that came in to be able to transfer that back out, right? What? So $3 million is a substantial amount. So what? why are we $3 million less, I guess? Where does it? Um, we had conservative revenue estimates for the last two fiscal years as well as our expenditures were under budget. So the combination of the two allowed for the, the village to move those transfers to the village's capital fund based on the financial policies that we have in place. Our fund balance, if it exceeds 40% in our corporate fund, the village may transfer those funds to our capital improvement funds to help offset some of the capital funds in the future for the village. So that being said, to, to get to the question that I think Trustee O'Rourke is asking, we don't budget for that uh, oh. uh, when we're creating this. It is a, at the end, af at uh, post uh, closure of the fiscal year, but pre-audit, we can take a look at where we stand and then um, make that transfer. So, so it's 
not some something. Some of those have been built up over the years, and you're saying those accounts, when they hit that 40 threshold, you transfer some of that. So it wasn't Correct. necessarily a one year. Correct, sir. Built up over the years. Right. Actually, there there was a um, our original plan back uh, about five years ago when we met with the uh, rating agencies uh, was that we had to uh, make sure that we start putting monies into our capital fund to uh, pay off the negative position on our capital fund. We had a $12 million uh, negative position on our capital fund that we had to uh, close. So that has been closed. And uh, with this last transfer that went into that capital account, we actually have now reached our stated minimum fund balance within that capital account. So with last year's transfer, we've actually gotten to a point where our corporate, our capital account is, uh, is at its um, uh, proper uh, thresholds. And fiscal 14, I believe, is the, um, we look at our financial policies on an annual basis. Fiscal 14, I believe, we implemented the 40% um, threshold and the ability to transfer those funds to capital. So to your point, um, that didn't happen until fiscal 14 for the first time. Professor Rourke's uh, information that we see the uh, data on a monthly basis, the easiest way to tell where the money is coming from is to look if the res revenue is above, you know, say, half the year. If it's above 50 percent, we have extra revenue that is above the budget. If you look at the expense side of it, uh, if instead of 50 percent, it's like 47 percent, you're making money on both sides of the equation. And that's what adds up at the end of the year when they decide to transfer and they do have the policy at 40 percent. But that's, that's the effect of the uh, very conservative budgeting process they go through. They don't expend what they budget, and they receive more money than they budget, which is a very good situation. And they've done it for the last five years, so it's a good way to, to track that on a monthly basis. Just take a look at those percentages in each of the categories, and I think you'll discover, you know, a lot of where it's coming from. So, well, it goes back to the administrator's conservatism at yeah, the beginning. Okay. Exactly. It's not a windfall. Anything. I mean, the windfalls in the old days used to be the building permits, but that disappeared about 2007 or so. And since then, uh, it's been strictly controlling the expenses. They, they, they get the job done, but they do it as efficiently as possible, and they do a fantastic job with that. And that's on a monthly, monthly basis. You can, you can pick that up. So, well, obviously, that's a testament to that budgeting and the conservative. Thank you. It really pays off. Yeah, it makes a huge difference in the ability for the village to uh, run. <laughs> also, largely why we've been able to keep our promise that our uh, property tax revenues would remain flat. You know, we, we made that promise to our uh, residents and to the community that we wanted to do that, and um, I'm pretty pleased that we've been able to manage that. Thank you. Any other questions? Or we will move on to building department. Okay, I'll start the conversation, and then Ken is right here to answer the technical questions. Or I can try, but I don't know if you'd want to hear all of my answers on that end. Um, here's the current org structure for the building department. And the proposed budget as it stands today. Um, obviously, the, the building department is responsible for the steps within permit processing and administration, um, plan review and in all the inspections that are listed on the screen um, to achieve code compliance within the village. Some of the numbers year to date, uh, residential permits currently through October 122. Uh, we'll see if we get to the 166 this year. Find some hidden houses along the way. Commercial permits, we're right at 83 right now, so we're about the same in the, as the last two years. Uh, which is good news. Inspections through October, 6,829 inspections. So we'll anticipate that going up slightly in the next couple months. Miscellaneous permits for 2015, 1123. And on the right side lists all the various miscellaneous permits that encompass uh, this slide. Within your packet, you have the building division summary, and on the back of that, I believe it's on the back of the page, is the um, detailed budget for the building division. Um, 
their building program right now includes an additional amount, as you can see on the summary page, for contractual services. Uh, that's the primary increase within this budget currently. And what that is including is um, contractual services related to possible outside plan reviews through our outside contractual uh, provider, HR Green. Um, in the event there are additional um, new developments that come in within the village for next fiscal year that need to be outsourced. Staff feels that it's a um, probably won't hit the $45,000 proposed budget, but wanted to put that into the budget just to ensure uh, in case some projects come at the same time or the size and the magnitude of the project is there that staff has the resources and ability to go externally to have that plan review process move a little more efficiently um, than having them all um, stagnant at the same time in case that happens. So that's the primary change within the building division budget that you see within your packet today. And Ken would be happy to answer any questions on the building division. <laughs> you did very well on that presentation, Ken. <laughs> Talk a little deeper next. I'm sorry, mine is just a point of clarity. So I, I, I thought you said that that was actually increasing for next year, but did it actually decrease from 2016 estimated? That's the estimated amount. So the okay. estimated amount is higher than what we've proposed currently in this current fiscal year. This oh, is one I of the areas the, that I you'll see. see it. Zero. Okay. That I usually see. never happens. But for a building department, we might be in a situation where we've had to use the outside contractors a little bit more just to get the plan reviews done and, and executed in a timely fashion. The last division that we have is uh, the planning department. So I'll let Michael speak to his... <laughs> As it relates to our uh, planning department structure, basically um, we have not uh, proposed any major modifications as it relates to the proposed structure. The structure generally with regards to the planning director, uh, we also have a planner too. Uh, both are uh, professionally certified with the American Institute of Certified Planners. Also, we have a certification from CNU and also a member of the Illinois Bar uh, on our staff. So uh, we're very fortunate to have continue our uh, education, our required certifications uh, in accordance with uh, the national AICP uh, requirements. As it relates to our proposed budget for uh, next year, our overall proposed budget, you can see generally uh, is relatively consistent with last year's, approximately 495,000 compared to approximately uh, 471,000 from last year. Um, as it relates to development, as you well know, um, something that we're quite proud of is we've seen, continue to see a real revitalization, continued interest uh, in our downtown uh, as it relates to what we've seen in the past year, and we actually f anticipate uh, future developments in our downtown uh, in 2016. Just very briefly to kind of review the projects, so you can actually see the progress, which is very exciting, is the trolley barn uh, itself. Uh, also, the uh, clock tower or the opera house, with regards to that, continued progress on that addition. In addition, the small, um, what, we, what we commonly refer as the original uh, town um, square building or the village hall building, uh, which is, will be a high-end um, uh, sushi bar, uh, which we hopefully will open up in the end of this year or 2016. So that just reflects some of the positive things as it relates to our downtown revitalization. As it relates to the development uh, trends, Along the 59 corridor, as you can well see, uh, the village board um, approved several major projects. As you can see, the major project is actually being constructed and coming close to completion uh, on the outlots of Myers, um, specifically uh, outlots uh, 2 and 9 with regards to uh, O'Reilly's, which is close to being finished, and also uh, the Pet Plus store at the hard corner of 135th Street and Route 59. Those are some of the uh, major new uh, commercial projects which were approved and which are again coming close to completion. Another project that was uh, reviewed this year was the uh, small project uh, with regards to the Kidney Dialysis Center uh, just north of Riverwalk. Uh, also they um, proposed two small retail buildings which were approved site plans and uh, the PUD for the overall the outlot at Target. That's in that case you remember we took a vacant uh, unused parking lot and we actually um, with a developer converted that into two future uh, commercial uh, buildings. So uh, that was another project that the village board approved and staff brought through the process. And finally, Crass Champions, uh, they should be uh, coming in for um, permit. Um, we took, again, a uh, underutilized property um, with regards to playing field supplies on just north of 143rd and Route 59. Uh, and that's a, ma a new major investment in an auto body facility 
uh, which again we anticipate will be opening in 2016. So these are just highlighting some of the uh, proposed, uh, actually approved projects um, as it relates to commercial development. Uh, historic preservation, uh, we were happy to see on uh, the village's oldest house, uh, the Ingersoll House, was fully uh, refurbished, renovated, uh, I think quite beautifully. Uh, that was actually identified or actually designated as a uh, local landmark. Uh, I think some of the trustees had an opportunity to actually tour that house. Again, the oldest house in the village of Plainfield goes back to the 1840s. So that was an exciting project to see completed this year as it relates to uh, historic preservation. Economic development, as you well know, um, staff is committed uh, to one of the, our major endeavors is economic development. Um, as I've already highlighted, some of the new projects, which I've highlighted, not only Pet Plus itself, but AT&T, O'Reilly's. We also approved the Napa store, Auto Parts, uh, Ross Discount finally opened this year. We have a new uh, restaurant, Villar, uh, in our downtown, along with Blue, a uh, high-end uh, uh, bar and restaurant. Speedway, we anticipate their opening within the next month or so. Uh, we also saw a major, um, approximately 6,000 square foot addition to the Edwards facility uh, down there on Dayfield Drive. And we saw the opening of Presence uh, Medical Facility, again, down on Dayfield. So we have a really nice new medical campus be really being developed along um, um, South Plainfield. And we can continue to anticipate there will be future development trends as it relates to future medical offices along South 59. With regards to our continued effort, as you know, we, are, we continue to work with a partnership. We look forward to um, one day having uh, a full-time economic development coordinator, um, but nevertheless, we're committed uh, with the current staff that we have uh, to pursue an every effort to attract businesses. So we continue to focus on the Heritage Battles commercial. We have seen several new uh, um, development, actually several new tenants actually occupy that space. Uh, one building that was success it's been very successful this year um, is the Vintage Harvest Commercial, which is not highlighted, but the Vintage Harvest Commercial, as you recall, they had a, actually that's just on 59, um, South 59. That at one point had almost 75% vacancy rates. That building, as we speak, is almost 100% occupied. So that's been a tremendous success with regards to the commercial projects. Again, we continue to uh, focus on Prairie Creek. We're working with a current developer right now on developing some of those outlots, and we anticipate a major new development on the Prairie Creek development uh, in 2016. Renwick and Route 30, again, not only with its speedway, but we work with some potential commercial developers at the hard corner of uh, Route 30 and Renwick, and we anticipate on some potential redevelopment opportunities concurrent with a potential TIF approval of the 30 corridor. As you well know, we are currently working in a TIF. Uh, we work, are working with SB Freeman. Uh, yes, you know the project, the potential TIF has been identified as being eligible, but nevertheless, we're working through the mechanics. Uh, we've had several properties coming for annexation, and we hope to anticipate a, a public hearing on this future proposed TIF, uh, probably uh, in the beginning of the new year. Um, with regards to the Village Center project, we've, you'll see a new um, actually residential development probably coming through within the next month or so for the Village Center project here, just located to the west of our downtown. Um, with regards to the 119 and Route 59, again, we focus on uh, several new potential developments. As you know, the Polo Club or what's commonly known as Dr. Two's property, we continue to get interest in that property. Uh, as you will know, the Boulevard property, we, again, we anticipate potentially a future development in that property uh, in 2017, so that will be a very exciting project there. Long term, we think there's an opportunity for the development of the southwest corner of Renwick and Route 59. Uh, we think that will be our major, major commercial node for the south um, Route 59 corridor itself. And we also continue to see um, potential um, development at Drowden in Route 126 and also um, Wallen Drive in 143rd. So that just highlights some of the things that we're focused on on a daily basis as it relates to attracting new uh, economic development, new business opportunities uh, to the village of Plainfield. As it relates to residential market, we're really seeing a really exciting recovery of the residential market. We're really seeing uh, strong sales um, in Springbank. Uh, Springbank, we anticipate we're seeing, um, as you know, NVR purchased almost uh, 90 lots. Um, Next Gen also purchased 90 lots in Springbank. So we really, not only this year, are we seeing strong sales in Springbank, but we anticipate 2016th 
will be a um, will be a very very strong year in spring bank and you'll see a lot of new rooftops going uh up in spring bank uh, in 2016. as you know fairfield ridge a project across the street they've had very strong sales um, I think they have an inventory of, I believe, less than 15 or 20 homes, which is just remarkable. This shows you that was, again, 72 units. So they've already gone through um, the construction. Almost have sold all but, I think, 20 or so units in probably less than a year and a half, which is, that's remarkable. Um, with the Arts of Grand Park, we're seeing a, the first model has already gone up for the uh, Cahovanian project uh, in Cotswolds. And we, again, anticipate strong sales in the Cotswolds project in 2016. So as it relates to residential development, uh, the biggest challenge right now is uh, the national builders and uh, semi-custom builders are literally running out of lots. There are very, believe it or not, there are very few lots that are available in the village of Plainfield, which again, I think is a remarkable uh, fact itself. So we anticipate 2016, you'll actually be seeing um, some ma- potential new entitlement of actually raw dirt um, I can't promise you that you'll see raw dirt being moved in 2016, but I definitely think the board will be reviewing some um, probably good-sized res- residential projects in 2016 uh, for new entitlement, which we have not done in some time. Um, with regards to long-term planning, uh, staff is again, continues to be dedicated uh, to long-term planning, looking out 10, 15, 20 years, which at the end of the day is what planning is all about. Uh, as you know, we already uh, streamlined or modified our sign ordinance uh, and village site plan review ordinance. We streamlined both of those ordinance, ordinances, and those will be coming for formal village board approval uh, within the next month or so. Um, with regards to long-term plans, staff continues to work on a corporate plan uh, for the Four Seasons uh, area between Lockport Street and 143rd. We anticipate or we believe in the long term there will be some really exciting opportunities to attra- attract a business park uh, long term along I-55 um, as part of the Four Seasons plan. We anticipate that plan will be, in, will be ready uh, sometime uh, this quarter and we'll be uh, in a position to take that to the board for review um, within hopefully the uh, first part of 2016. And the downtown central area plan, we continue to be committed to long-term planning for our downtown. As it relates to the business licenses and evolution center, staff continues to manage the business licenses. Uh, this year, we uh, processed over 600 business licenses in the village of Plainfield. Uh, um, and with regards to the administration of regulation of our home occupancies, we continue to see a real renaissance uh, in new businesses uh, for home occupancies. And that com- continues to be a really strong part of the village's overall economic um, environment. And also our management of the Evolution Center, we continue to get really good feedback of the Evolution Center, basically providing small businesses an opportunity to act as an incubator for startups. Um, so that is something we continue to manage from that perspective. As it relates to some of our other responsibilities, the village continues to be, the uh, planning department continues to be dedicated to the Green Village Initiative, uh, specifically working with the library on some, a number of educational seminars, promoting green, sustainable um, educational efforts throughout the village of Plainfield. As you know, um, the Rain Barrel program has been tremendously successful. Just fantastic, great feedback uh, from that program over the past years that continues to grow and grow and grow on an annual basis. So that's something, again, we're very proud of um, from a from sustainable conservation perspective. The Plainfield Riverfront, uh, a lot of exciting things are happening there. We continue, staff continues to be dedicated to that endeavor. Um, we think there's a long-term opportunity to create a wonderful uh, place, uh, placemaking as it, as it relates to the creation of a, a vibrant uh, riverfront along the du- DuPage River. And with respect to conservation playing field, again, uh, something we con- are committed to promoting conservation and sustainable practices throughout the village of playing field. And with that, um, that kind of provides you a summary of some of the things we have done, looking past, back in the mirror from last year, but more importantly, looking to the future and some of the great opportunities we have for 2016. And with that, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Ms. Pluckham, do you want to go over the numbers rather quickly? You should have within your packet the planning division uh, summary page, as well as on the back of that page is all the detail for the planning division. Um, Generally speaking, the only um, relative increase is within the contractual services area, and there's been a placeholder um, within that area of the budget 
in the event economic development position doesn't necessarily move forward, there's some outside resources that we can tap into as far as economic development projects or programs, or any sort of planning programs. So there's it was originally budgeted at twenty five thousand for this current fiscal year. Um, staff has placed thirty five thousand dollars in additional funds for possible contractual services for these purposes. Um, but again, at this point in time, it's status quo as far as positions are concerned. Um, the increases, other increases that you might see are related to salary and benefit related um, line items. I guess I would just like to say coming from the Planning Commission, wow, that sounds exciting. <laughs> you got a lot of stuff going on. So it, certainly I would support as we discussed a little bit before about adding um, the economic development helper to your team because I think ultimately if that person performs correctly and the, the economy continues to grow as it is ultimately will end up paying for itself so great job that's my only comment is that uh, uh, it's too that we don't, don't have an audience we have staff and we have a board uh, what they're missing is the fact that uh, this is a very safe town to live in, as the chief mentioned, and uh, it's a very exciting place, as Mr. Garrigan just described. we got a lot going on, and Public Works works fantastically. Navy does a nice job of getting things out, and Ken keeps the buildings going. So uh, do a great job, and it's uh, a great place to live. So thank you. Well, thank you everybody for uh, the feedback to uh, the staff uh, throughout uh, the last uh, couple of uh, Committee of the Whole sessions. As uh, Mrs. Plecka mentioned, uh, you will see the tax levy item coming to you in the, uh, well, at the next board meeting. They have to vote to actually put that forward as a public hearing. And then the public hearing will be held on December the 7th. Uh, with potentially a uh, consideration of that vote on the 7th as well. Uh, if there's any questions that come up, we will uh, then have the uh, second meeting in December to be able to vote on that. As a reminder, it does need consideration by that uh, Tuesday after our second meeting in order for it to be uh, placed uh, forward um, by the uh, uh, powers that be. Um, and with that, I um, don't know that we have any other uh, things for the board, but uh, thank you very much for your feedback and your input. And um, thanks. Reminders. Brian, really quick before we go to reminders, Brian, just a point of clarification. There's a publishing requirement as well that. Correct. Will the board be advised of it, or should we just check the newspaper? Where would we publish yeah, it? Yeah, we, we publish. We the week of the 23rd of November, it will be published so that Thursday when the Enterprise comes out, you'll see it within that yes excellent so take a look at the enterprise reminders november 11th our offices will be closed for veterans day the 12th is historic preservation commission 16th would be our regular village board meeting and the 23rd will be our next committee of the whole meeting we're seeking motion to adjourn so moved. moved motion's been made to adjourn all in favor Aye. all opposed Thank you, that motion carries.